Be Fabulous with Vips and Vicky, the Think Shift podcast for professionals who aspire to be fabulous leaders, those who not only succeed, but also purposefully seek to reinvent the world. In this episode, we start at the beginning. What does it mean to be fabulous? What are the four non-negotiables of being fabulous? And will make you ask yourself, am I truly fabulous? All that coming up in this episode. Welcome to our very first Be Fabulous podcast. Um, We've been threatening to do this for coming on five years now. And, uh, you know, a combination of uh, events that are going on in the world, plus um, no shortage of encouragement from the wonderful team here, um, being led by, you know, the incomparable Vicky Shillington has kind of forced us into a place where we are now doing this. And uh, I can't thank her enough. Uh, Vicky, say hello to everyone. Hi, everyone. It's uh, so exciting for us to be doing these podcasts. Everybody loved our solidarity hours, and this is the next evolution. So welcome. We're going to have so much fun today. So to put this in perspective, because obviously we're going to have a lot of first, first-time listeners today, this is our Be Fabulous podcast, and uh, that's very loaded, because at this point in time, very few of you even know what that means. Uh, it means something very specific to us, and our whole, our whole reason to exist both as a company, but also something that we feel very close to as, uh, as people at ThinkShift is this idea that we want fabulous leaders. We don't have enough of them. We have too many executives out there who aren't particularly fabulous. And uh, we have too many leaders that aren't particularly fabulous. And we would like to do our little bit to try to um, help create the next generation of fabulous leaders that will do purposeful things in the world and hopefully re- reinvent it in some positive way. Um, we're going to be really, the way this is going to work is we're going to do a bit of a deep dive. We're going to have guests on certain podcasts, but predominantly it's going to be the Vicky and Vip show, uh, which is good because uh, Vicky is way more exciting than I am. I just have a nicer voice apparently, but she, but she she's way more bubbly and her, her jokes are way better than mine as well. So um, the way, 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 what we're going to do today is really just lay the foundations for what does it mean to be a fabulous person and hopefully make you think, oh, I wonder if I'm fabulous. Um, and then we're going to really use that as a, a bit of a guide. It's like your weekly guide on, am I being fabulous? Am I, am I doing the right things at work in a professional environment? Am I looking at life and my career um, appropriately? Am I doing the right things to make me successful? Am I doing the right things to make me happy? Am I doing the right things for my family? Am I doing the right things for my relationships? Um, all of these things come together and there's probably no better time to do this than against the backdrop of, well, certainly in my lifetime, um, you know, probably the most critical period in, in human history in my lifetime. So, you know, if there was ever a need for fabulous leadership at all levels, um, this is the time. So that's kind of my intro. Vicky, I don't know if you want to add anything else. I, uh, I just want to say that for me, the word uh, fabulous became something that I embodied when I turned 40. I decided when I turned 40 that for the rest of my life, I wanted to be around fabulous people, be in fabulous environments and work with fabulous clients. And it had a very specific and unique definition to me. And as we explore what it means, I know you each internalizing, I know what fabulous means. There's something sparkly. There's something juicy about it. And I have been really pleased that Phipps and I were chatting and this word This word took over, and it now is an all-encompassing way for how we think about the characteristics that make us be the kinds of humans that we want to be for lasting journeys and legacies. Flips back to you. That's a bit bit deep. Uh, (laughs) You've raised the bar, Vicky. All right. So I I thought what would be really helpful to do is um, just really give a a bit of a history really on um, how this came about. What is a fabulous person and how do we, how do we wrap our arms around what is quite a nebulous term? So uh, you know, what people don't realize um, that I talk to all the time is actually I didn't come up with the term fabulous person. Vicky came up with the term fabulous person way, way back when in a previous life in London um, when we were all at Quedis. And it was our way of referring to the kinds of people that we wanted to hire, but we had no other way of really expressing it. So we invented, or at least Vicky invented the word and it kind of stuck. And it wasn't really until several years later 
when, um, it was like a secret code. Vicky knew what I meant when I said fabulous. She knew what I meant when we said fabulous. We probably had a reasonably solid understanding. There's actually a couple of other folks that are kind of part of our listening crowd today. Jamie, I'm sure, knows what fabulous means intrinsically in his soul, who's on, who's on the call today from Australia. And, um, uh, but, but I never really took the time to sit down and say, okay, there is something in this. I think I didn't even realize how important it was until uh, the origins really of, of Think Shift and when it came about and what became Shift Up and, and that the sort of the background to, to being fabulous, the way, I, the way I express it now and explain it to people is there's lots of people out there who are really good. They're really good at their jobs. They're, they're great at doing whatever it is that they do. They, you know, whether in software development, whether they're in accounting, whether they're in marketing, whether they're in finance, whether they're in HR, there's many, many, many people out there who are very good at their jobs. But sadly, that doesn't make them fabulous in our world. Um, so fabulous, so, so then the question becomes, oh, what the hell is fabulous? So fabulous for us, um, and we're gonna go way deeper into this, but in simple terms, like the exec summary version, is fabulous people are those who have the greatest potential together with the will to do something purposeful in the world. And that, that's quite loaded because, because when you're relatively young, starting off on your career, success tends to look a lot like doing well in your job, earning some money, um, I was going to say moving to New York, although I think most people are trying to move out of New York right now. But but you get the idea. The idea is these these things look different. You get to um, you get to a stage in life maybe where family is more important to you. Maybe you have children, and suddenly being in Manhattan all the time doesn't feel so good. And you start looking at other aspects of what constitute being successful. So these these terms like you know you too could be successful, the ten step process to being successful, they, they don't resonate very well with me because successful tends to be something very very individual and very very unique to each person. So it turns out that being fabulous is who has got the greatest potential to go through these various stages in life and continue to propagate and pray and and sort of. I pay that fabulousness forward. And it, you know, it came about because I read a book and it's a book I strongly recommend people read, although it's a bit heavy. So the audible version is probably the way to go. And it was by a guy called Thomas Friedman. Um, he's done a couple of books, but the one I was reading at the time was Hot, Flat and Crowded. And it was really just talking about how the world, you know, how, however we look at it, and this was written you know, 15 years ago, was that the world is going to get hotter, it's gonna get flatter, uh, because of what technology is doing. And it's going to get more crowded because, because pandemics aside, the human population is going to continue to increase. And, and, and when, you, when you look at it through that lens, that's going to create enormous amounts of social, economic, political challenges for us as a world, as a species, if you like. And it dawned on me that, you know what, I don't, I don't know if our leadership structures, whether it be in businesses, whether it be in schools, whether it be nationally, are they, are they geared up for that kind of challenge? And that's kind of what got me thinking about, well, okay, well, what, what does it mean to be a fabulous person then? And, and how, how do we create these leaders of the future that are going to be more appropriate for that kind of world, even though we don't know how to define it? So... In simple terms, that meant that the kinds of people that were likely to be successful leaders or fabulous leaders in the future were likely to be the ones who could adapt quickest as opposed to the people that maybe had 20 years of experience doing something or 30 years of experience of doing something or I've been doing this job for 35 years, therefore I know how to do everything there is to do with it. And I realized that actually, What's making people successful now, both professionally and personally, tends to be the speed at which they're able to adapt to a changing environment, more so than whatever skills they've accumulated over 15, 20 years in hard skills terms. And that's really how, that's really how fabulous leadership came about. It was how do we create people who want to continue learning and continue adapting? And then it turns out that from a, from a psychological and even from a neuroscience point of view, there are certain characteristics and aptitudes that allow people to, or enable people to rewire themselves more easily. And those were gonna be the fabulous few. So if you could find the fabulous few 
that are going to continually feel comfortable um, rewiring, reinventing, being willing to uh, not rest on the laurels of their previous experiences and and try to do something new. Those were going to be the ones that were going to have the best chance of reinventing the world in some positive way. What do you reckon, Vicky? Oh, my gosh. There's so much richness in that. Lips. I think we're going to have to unpack it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think what I, what I would say is for, we're going to be unpacking this for the next year. So, <laughs> so I, you know, you know in, in sort of true um, takeaway form, I, I know what I would say, a fabulous person is someone who has the potential to persistently rewire. That's the first takeaway. Someone who is prepared to put themselves through what it takes to constantly challenge what they believe and choose to rewire and learn new skills. That's, that to me is number one. Number two, and this is where I think it gets hard because I think there's a lot of people in our leadership coaching world that, that meet that, 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 that need. The second one's way harder to hit though. And that's the people who want to direct that towards some kind of purposeful, positive systemic change in the world. Like I, I actually want to have an impact on sustainability, recycling, equality, racism, reinvention of certain industries, whatever it may be. Um, that's, it's much harder. It's much harder to take that personal need to want to grow and learn and rewire and then say, I'm going to direct it towards some kind of change that's, that's big and meaningful because that's just a world of pain. I mean, it's, it's not easy to um, bring about positive change in the world because there's always people who don't want it. And then the third thing, and that's my third takeaway, is it's a reaction to the reality of what I observed. And Vicky, I do want you to talk about this, which is, it's very deep to me, is this, this realization uh, about maybe six, seven years ago that the world just seems to be full of people that we call leaders who are not really leaders. They are executives. They are people who do a good job, but they're not people who, when you look behind them, are creating followership and certainly not creating followership towards some, some positive, purposeful end. I'm really curious, Vicky, on your take on that. That's my, that's my three-point summary on what is a fabulous person, which we've not rehearsed up until this point. <laughs> oh, that's nicely said. Yeah, the challenge uh, in these organizations, and I'm sure many of you have recognized this, is when you start out, you have so much enthusiasm and uh, you work so hard, you want to do whatever it takes to be successful. And if you're lucky, you do really, really well at that. And people recognize you for your qualities, for working really, really hard and being diligent, um, being very pleasant to be around, being very helpful, willing. You've got the tenacity to keep going. And they think, wow, we, we, we really value you. So they decide to promote you to a manager. And now your world shifts. And you don't know why it's shifted. So... In your mind, you think, well, I got promoted. It was time for me to get a title. It was time for me to get more money. I'm really good. Everyone tells me I'm really, really good. And now I need to keep doing what I always did. But I have a team. Yay! And the challenge, if you take that approach of doing what you always did and being that superstar performer, is now the team doesn't really appreciate you as much as they did before because as humans need autonomy we need growth uh, we need to be able to show our worth and value and if we keep doing what we did before the thing we know how to do is do a fantastic job at getting the thing done so we know exactly how to tell somebody else how to get something done the challenge is they don't love that humans do not like to be told how to get things done they need to know why why we need to do it, um, which is often forgotten. Uh, they need to buy into it. There needs to be a powerful enrollment because we can't get anyone to do anything. We might be able to in the short term, but it has long-term consequences. So we need to be able to give them a powerful enrollment so they buy into the why, and then we need to clarify the what and what success looks like and, and have that clarity so they know what they're achieving. And then we need to back off and let them figure out the how and through the use of great questions and check-ins, be able to figure out how things are going without necessarily trampling on their perspective. 
And when you take into consideration that every person has different motivations, different reasons why they're there, different skills, a different background and culture and nuances of how they think and see the world, <laughs> now you've layered in this whole world of complexity that you just haven't been equipped to deal with. And so that creates a whole another world of pain. And so the stress starts to pile on. And no one tells you there's a different way, unless you get lucky. I banged my head against a brick wall for three years until I had a performance review that was less than ideal. And Vips is smiling here because he remembers this one. I was always, if we had a five point rating scale, I was number five. And this one year I was the number four when I was devastated as any superstar performer would be. But actually what it taught me, um, and as Vips mentioned, if you're constantly willing to reinvent and rewire yourself, it caused me to pause and reflect and think, is there a different way? And just the fact that I was able to pause and reflect caused me to open up my mind to a different way of operating. And that's that pivotal moment. Do you keep doing what you've always done or are you willing to pause and say, hey, is my current behavior really serving me for where I am right now and where I need to get to? Or am I doing what I always did? So there's a great distinction that we're seeing right now in this world where a number of my clients are coming to me and saying, I'm just noticing this new behavior. And as we've dug into, perhaps they're feeling overwhelmed or overworked. As we've dug in, actually it's not a new behavior. It's a recurring behavior. It's one they've always had. They just hadn't seen it before. It's now exacerbated. So understanding what are our triggers and what happens to us and being willing to throw it all away and be open to whatever someone is willing to share to us or how they experience us, that allows us to start to think about this journey of, well, what's required for me in this environment to be successful, to move forward with something I truly, truly care about that's going to serve the greater good in the world? I, I've got to speak up there, Vicky, because like you, you said it so eloquently, but what people, I, I just want to say, Vicky is a true, like the, the Vicky that you see today is not old Vicky. <laughs> like, I, I can't even express how, how different a person this was. I mean, Vicky was the quintessential, I'm going to get it done. I'm going to drive everyone really hard. I'm going to be the taskmaster. If there's 40 things to do, we'll do 60 things and we'll do it by tomorrow. <laughs> she, she, it's, it's, it's just like a different person. Like I, I it, there's very few people who remember that. Um, and her whole persona is com something completely different. And I, I think it's, I, later we're going to talk about, well, what were the qualities that made someone do that? And, and it, you get back to these things that we call the non-negotiables and 4Ds, and we're going to talk about them a little bit later. But it is, it is absolutely astonishing that if you're prepared to reinvent yourself, you can almost always do it. It's just, it's just a high emotional and personal cost to wanting to engage on that journey because you don't see the results quickly. Do you mind, do you mind commenting, Vicky? How long did it take you to start seeing the benefits of it? Well, it's more than that, Vips. It's actually very, very painful when you start to realize you're butting up against your ego. Yeah. Um, because really what you're doing is you're having to acknowledge that a lot of your core beliefs and how you think you see yourself is not necessarily going to serve you. It's the old adage of well, what got you here is not going to get you there. And being willing to always challenge that and think about, is it really serving me? And being open to it and... You know, even to this day, those old triggers do come back to me. You know, Vips and I have had long conversations with, I, I never really want to manage a team again. Vips is like, well, you're so good these days at managing a team. I'm like, I know I am. I've built them a number of times. I've got over my demons. But I'm like a recovering alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so worried. that's scared that about reversion. Yeah, because it's so deep inside me and it's all fear-based. Anytime we try and control or um, operate in a way that's counter to what's the real good, is it comes from a place of genuine fear, whether we're willing to acknowledge it or not, fear that we're not good enough, fear that we're going to get caught out, fear that we're not adding value. So being willing to challenge those assumptions and just rest in there. Actually, it's not about us doing. I mean, obviously, we can all do. We can learn whatever it is. It's actually who we are that people are buying into and being okay with who we are and shedding the unnecessary scales that are no longer serving us. Um, that's, that takes time, and it's continual progress. And my, my current journey has focused every year on, I want two or three deeply transformative experiences each year 
which causes me to seek out these incredible humans, whether it's working with horses and changing the way we see ourselves, or shamans, or, I mean, you name it, embodiment work, I mean, you name it, it's, it's that deep work that every time you go through it, another little layer of you sheds as you think, oh, there's something else I didn't even know that was part of me, because as humans, we are so unself-aware, we have no idea what's really going in inside us. Yeah, so true. So true. Yeah. It, the, the, this idea of um, butting up against your identity is something I think we'll be coming back, back, back to again and again and again. What made me laugh is you talked about the journey to getting to a manager. It's a whole new world of pain when you make it to an executive. Right. Because then you realize that now you, now you don't even know what's going on. Like now, now, you're, now you're two, three steps removed from anyone that knows that that's actually doing anything. Okay. And now you're, you're, you know, you're managing your life through spreadsheets and PowerPoints and, and these kind of, you know, which, which to use a UKism, what, what, you know, what lever over here do I pull as opposed to a lever? Um, you know, you know, what, what do I pull over here to make this happen over there? And, and, and you, but yeah, you're, you're, you're shedding this idea that once upon a time you used to be good at something and now you're not even good at that anymore because there's someone younger, brighter, sharper, who can do it faster than you, better than you, knows the latest tools, knows the latest frameworks, knows the latest, you know, and quite frankly, can probably out athlete you as well. Um, that, that, you know, that, this is why we see that, that, you know, executive midlife crisis for want of a better phrase. Um, and, uh, you know, my view is that's also why you see so many executives and so few leaders, because I think what happens is people get comfortable. They get comfortable with the large salaries. They get comfortable with a, with operating, if you will, a part of a business that they're responsible for. So that, so they, you know, like you said, they start playing to, um, they start playing for status quo. They start playing to not lose rather than start playing to win. Um, not everyone, but I'm talking about as a, as a, as a, as a set across everybody. And I think it's even worse, the more senior you get, particularly if you faked your way there. Because yeah. if you faked your way there, you're in a whole world of pain now, because now, now you're going to get found out too. So then you've got to pretend to be something that you're not. And that's going to make it very difficult to peel open the um, layers that you were describing, because the price is too high. And it's why, why people feel so defensive and so unwilling to hear feedback, because they don't really want to know what they understand to be true. Yeah. They don't really want to see the reality because they've got so much to lose. They've got big mortgages, they've got bills to pay, they've got expensive school fees to pay. And so that little bit of them, that soul, that little voice just gets beaten away and drummed down. And, and we start numbing, Vips. You know, my numbing agent of choice is sugar. Um, oh, there's alcohol, there's... Coffee. Coffee, coffee. there's <laughs> carbohydrates. I love you got coffee. coffee. <laughs> yeah. It's coffee. And... And, and even even distraction, you know, yeah. if we're busy and distracted. I mean, this is why this period is so challenging for so Tiger many King. people. Tiger King. <laughs> it's a sad time when Tiger King is uh, is here to save us, Bips. But yeah, <laughs> but it's uh, it's it's so easy to numb because we don't like to be alone with our feelings because we know if we are, we're going to have to give in to what we really really want, and it's too hard. But here's the thing, Bips: humans are designed for hardship. Yeah, it's true. We are designed to get through really, really tough times, and that's when we grow and learn the most. So why are we so scared of a little discomfort of emotions? If we just sit with them and breathe into them, guys listening, this is a great thing for you to do. Next time it comes up, just sit with it for a minute and breathe into it. It'll pass. You don't have to numb, because the more we numb, the more we need to numb. And it just takes practice, and that's when we grow, because we start to realize, I got through that. That wasn't so bad. I think that's the one benefit of experience. You realize that all these things that you thought were terrible somehow <laughs> were okay. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, I think that's the one thing that I think is a difficult thing to have perspective on earlier on in, in, in career and life. So I think we should probably switch attention given, given the time, Vicky, to you know, like, let's, let's talk a little bit about like, because what we've really described there really is all those people who are very good. They're very, very intelligent. They're very bright. They're doing good work. They're probably being nice people as well. There's not, you know, there's no, nothing wrong with that. But I don't think that meets our fabulous definition, right? Correct. Right? Which is kind of hard, right? Like, because there's many people out there who who be possibly listening to this and they'll be thinking like, well, that sounds great. If I could be doing those and I had a team and, and I was an executive earning 400 grand a year, I think that'd be wonderful. I'd be really happy. Everything would be wonderful, right? right? And we're sitting here saying, well, yeah, but that doesn't make you fabulous. 
Yeah. We just, we've, we got just, a high, we've got a high bar. We've got a high bar. <laughs> we've got a high bar. And that's so, okay. So I think we should talk a little bit about, all right, so the reason why they may or may not be fabulous is because of that idea about those people that are comfortable with, with the combination of persistent rewiring and also the desire to do something positive with it in the world, right? So those are the two things that, that, that kind of you need to have in addition to. And so, you know, when all this started, you know, I started, I started figuring out, you know, some things that with enough self-efficacy and self-work, you can actually change pretty much anything about you, right? However, most of us won't do that in our lifetimes, okay? Yeah. So I'm, I'm starting with that assumption. Most of us are not gonna get to Dalai Lama, Yoda level, I'm one with the force. Then we're not gonna get there, right? So there were certain characteristics, if you will, which ultimately became our non-negotiables and became our four Ds, which were, these are things you can absolutely change, but they're really damn hard. They, they're, gonna, they're gonna take you decades, right? So, so we can kind of, um, uh, either we start working on it earlier with, you know, with kids, with students, with people who are in their 20s, if you like, earlier on in their career, because if they start working on it, then they've got a chance. You're going to find it hard to shift these things if you're already, you know, like me, crusty old 45 year old. It's highly unlikely that I could fundamentally change some of these things if I didn't have them already. You could do it, but it's, it's, a, it's a much harder rewiring. And so I want to just talk a little bit. About, so we realized that it was, these, it was these predictors. I call them predictors. So if you meet what I call the fabulous person non-negotiables and you meet, for me, if you could do two of the 40s and, and uh, I'll help you with the other two, but you've got to meet, you've got to meet the non-negotiables. Otherwise, it's really, really difficult to be the kind of person that's going to persistently rewire and who's going to, who's going to propagate that in some positive way. So should we do, should we do non-negotiables or should we do four Ds first, Vicky? Ah, let's do non-negotiables first. Non-negotiables. Should we take it in turns? I'll do the first one. You do the next one. All right, let's do it. All right, let's do it. So the first one I'm going to pick out is, off, is actually the hardest one. Um, and it's the one that says, uh, or it's the hardest one to understand. It's not the hardest one to do. It, and what, it's what I call aligned values and ethics. And what that's really saying is a lot. What it's saying is firstly, you have to have values and ethics. It is extraordinary to me how many people haven't really taken the amount of time, particularly young professionals. Um, they, just, they just haven't needed to. They've, they've gone through, they've gone through their, their, their studies, they're, they're in good jobs, and they've just never really taken the time to really think about what, what constitutes my values and ethics system. They've, maybe they've inherited it from their parents or their environment or where they grew up or the schools they went to, but, but they haven't really thought about it too much. And so, so it kind of presupposes that you're someone who cares enough to want to think about what your value system is. Because without that, you're never going to be able to be purposeful in the future. But in the aligned bit, the aligned values piece is really saying that when you, when you are in an environment or a company, in our case, normally, or organization, or a city, um, that doesn't align with those values and ethics, you, it, it's gonna go wrong. It might not go wrong in a week, it might not go wrong in a month, it might not go wrong in a year, it might not go wrong in two years, but it's definitely gonna come out in the wash. And that's what I mean by being, having aligned values and ethics. Companies, they have code for this, they call it cultural fit, right? Are you a good cultural fit? And it, it's, a, it's a goal, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a minefield, you know, what is cultural fit? But at its core, what it boils down to is, do you feel that the environment that you're in represents something that you care sufficiently enough that you have a high degree of alignment with, with you as a person and what that environment stands for and how it behaves? So that to me is aligned values and ethics. So that's adding on to that. Um, another dimension is to think about when you walk into a company, often they'll have the values up on the wall. And they very proudly show them and display them. And it's on their websites, it's in their marketing material, it's everywhere. And then as you get to speak to the individuals, you start to realize that very few of those values are actually lived and breathed in day to day. And so people see it, frankly, as a joke. Yep. And so as a new hire, you are excited to join, you've had a great experience, you come on board, you bought into those values, and you start to notice, usually even on day one, how things aren't the way you thought they were from the way it was set up. And at that very moment, 
your your emotional contract with the company is broken, broken. right? And yeah. it's very difficult to get it back then. The other the other dimension to think about is it's not just the values of the company, but it's very specific. Vips use the word the environment. So your department, your team, or the whole company or the organization may be going through some transformation. So just as fabulous people need to rewire themselves, so organizations need to keep changing themselves and rewiring themselves to stay relevant. Uh, we've all experienced that, and that causes a lot of disruption. But if an organization is going through, for example, right now, everybody's going through an agile transformation, and you're not fundamentally aligned to the philosophies or of self-autonomous teams and working to support others, and you much prefer the top-down command and control style, fundamentally, you're going to have a massive issue in dealing with the environmental change around you. And as Vip said, ultimately, it's never going to work out. Either you'll check out or they'll check you out. <laughs> but it just doesn't work. And so it's always worth reflecting. If you're deeply, deeply disturbed by what's going on around you, is that really the right environment? And what are you willing to sell your soul for? What is yeah. it doing to you? Because it's having a massive effect on your soul, which manifests eventually in your body. And that's why we know so many people have midlife crises, so many people have illnesses and yeah. things happen to them as they get older because they're taking on the environmental stress that they just know is not their sole design in the world. They're here for a different purpose. So true. And yeah, you reminded me of something I, should, I want to add to that as well, which is, and I see that's one of my alarm signals is when I see new, new CEOs, new presidents, new, you know, heads of department, new CIOs, whatever they are, like these senior level roles. And, and they call you up and say, oh, I need to do some mission values work. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and in their heads, they're thinking, I, I, I want five words and a statement that sounds good on a website somewhere or on a brochure somewhere. Right. And, and, and as soon as I hear that request, I'm like, okay, that's normally a signal to me that there's a high likelihood that this person isn't fabulous. <laughs> because if they've got to that point and that's how they're looking at that challenge, then it's inherently likely to be something that is being approached more as a, I learned in MBA school that you need to have one, so let me figure out how to have one. It's a tactic rather than a value system alignment opportunity. That's maybe the way I would describe it. Yeah. And similarly, if they come in and in the first 90 days, they want to do a restructure and they haven't taken the time truly to assimilate. One of the most evolved CEOs I worked with, he said to me, Vicky, the first year, it's all about learning. And the second year, you finally know enough that you can have a strategy. You throw your first year strategy out the window. And those who've lived through this know what we're talking about. So it's, it's, it's taking the time to truly understand for the environment what you need. So yeah, You're about to get me on my soapbox. Don't do this, Vicky. <laughs> right, right? You got me on my second pet peeve, which is, these, which is people who hire executives because they want instant results. Yeah. Right? So what then happens is they get an instant result. They get instant action. Right? But what they really do is just create instant reactive action. So nothing, nothing actually improves over time. You just, you, you just get this kind of illusion. It's like, the, it's like the addiction you were talking about. You get this illusion of stuff happening. Oh, you know, this leader came in, they got rid of X people, they reduced workforce by 20, they made these savings, they did that. They did, they did a whole bunch of stuff, but it didn't actually move anything forward. And it becomes very reactive. <laughs> well, eventually, eventually it becomes the Titanic Vips. <laughs> All right, second fabulous person non-negotiable. Oh, I'll do it, Vips. Can you remember it? it? Yeah. Go for it. So our next um, non-negotiable is um, having an inside-out mentality. So think of this as the self-awareness we need as humans to really understand how others are experiencing us. This is about us taking responsibility for our actions, not blaming others, not being the victim. Woe be me, why is this happening to me? You know, is it my situation today? Is it the world? Like, what is it? Nope, it's all you and how you see the world. So this one is particularly challenging because it's one of those that I see to be the most pervasive in organizations. And it comes back 50,000 years. When we lived in tribes 50,000 years ago, if we spoke out, we could literally get kicked out of the tribe and die. And so this need to stay in the tribe, this need to fit in, this need to be quiet and play small and not rock the boat goes back 50,000 years, and that's why it feels so primal. It's why public speaking 
is such a fear for so many people. And for me, again, on my journey, you know, in my early part of my career, I couldn't speak in front of more than two or three people and want to throw up. Um, luckily, I've overcome that now. But that was a massive journey to go through because it feels that primal. So when someone is sharing with you how they experience you, that defensive mechanism kicks in going back 50,000 years, which is, oh, they don't like me. That doesn't sound nice. What if they kick me out of the tribe? And we don't even know that that's going on, Vips. So it takes a lot of deep work and a lot of openness and, and humility to have what Carol Dweck calls a beginner's mindset um, and be able to really learn from that place as opposed to a fixed mindset, which just says, hey, this is the way I am and good luck with that. It takes a lot of humility, but you also have to recognize that humans are terrible at how we see ourselves. You know, we think we're great, but we're looking in a mirror and a mirror is only a reflection. It's not the accuracy of what, what we get to see, what others get to see when they look at us. So <laughs> we have to think about that, that deeply and think, well, if we truly want to understand how others experiences as opposed to this mirrored reflection that we see in a mirror, we have to understand how they experience us. And so we have to drag it out of them because it goes back 50,000 years. It's edgy. They're not going to share. They're not going to risk it. It's too edgy. What are your thoughts, Vips? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, the inside out mentality, I, I almost equate that one to the journey of life, right? It's like you, you're going to work on that forever. You know, you're, you're always, always, always going to get, hopefully get better at that, but you have to want to. Um, and, and the kind of um, how that starts manifesting itself as you get better at it is it takes you to a place of you know, you, you, st you start off thinking that everything that's happening to you is because someone else is causing it, right? As a child, as a, as a kid, you're growing up, your parents are telling you what to do, um, your school's telling you what to do, your teachers are telling you what to do, whatever, right? So you kind of fall into that pattern. But the more you realize, is, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm, only, I'm behaving that way because I've been conditioned to behave that way. I'm not sure I believe any of that anymore, you know? Uh, but you don't, you don't, you don't even want to go back. Why would you go back? It served you well, particularly if you're successful, right? I mean, why would you even question it? So this, this idea of inside out mentality, what it does is we, 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 it's very easy for us to condition ourselves to think that what's happening to us is a consequence of something that someone else is doing to us, as opposed to, I have chosen to participate in this pantomime that's allowing right. this to occur to me, <laughs> right? And, and I, the way I see it manifest itself is often, you know, People pay lip service. Do you talk about Carol Dweck? I'll give you another one. People, people pay lip service to servant leadership all the time, right? They pay lip service. To, they don't actually know what it means. They, they see it as doing something nice for my community. So that's servant leadership or, you know, like, or, or you know, I stick up for my team first, therefore I'm showing servant leadership. And that's part of it, right? It's part of it, but it's, it's so much richer than that. It's, to me, that's like a grade school understanding of servant leadership. There's like, you know, there's like PhD level that goes up further. And, and, and the way, best way I can summarize it is, you know, when you get to a place where you're always looking at what can I do to improve something that I don't like, as opposed to what can someone else do to improve my situation, right? That, that's when you kind of know you're on the right track. And also when you start to think about um, what if it's not about me? What if it's got nothing to yeah, do with right. me and I get no props and I get no kudos? I'm out of the picture. What would you then do to take care of everybody else? What would that look like? How would you solve their problems? And when you come yeah. at it from that place of true service and the ego is no longer involved because you realize you are where you are because of who you are and how you show up, then the rest of it becomes magical. But that is a massive shift in the corporate world that we grow up in, especially in the Western society, because everything is all about the extrinsic rules. It's not necessarily about the things we're talking about. It's yeah. Yeah. And to me, that's what, that's the difference between that, that top notch executive who's really, really good at their jobs and the fabulous leader yeah. that you will unequivocally follow. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's where it comes from. It comes from, um, it comes from the personal power is the phrase we used a lot, which is probably the whole, whole other podcast at some point. So that, that's, yeah, you're right. Th those, you, I think we picked the two richest ones. The, the next two are a little bit easier to understand. Um, and what I'm going to talk about next will be the third non-negotiable, which is what we call, well, we call it two things. I used to call it energy and desire, but more recently I've started calling it grit and hustle. I think that's probably just because I spent too much time in New York. Um, but but it's, it, it, there's this basic idea that, that whatever you want to achieve 
for yourself in life, any, any cognitive rewiring that what you want to do is going to require self-discipline and reps. Nothing happens. Like your, your brain doesn't do anything without reps and practice. It just doesn't do it. And so in the same way as we don't, you know, we understand, we, we, we wrap our heads around the idea that, you know, if I want to build muscle, then I need to work out and lift some more weights. And if I do that frequently enough over an extended period of time, I'm going to build muscle, assuming I'm eating correctly and so forth. With your brain though, it's being willing to repeatedly do things that we find unfamiliar and uncomfortable and persevere when they seem hard and seem difficult and they seem like you're going to fail because that kind of attraction to wanting to do things that you might fail at is a necessary component of helping you rewire and reinvent at those points in your career and your life that's going to project that's going to propel you faster and quite frankly more successfully through that period and it's this kind of this gets blamed a lot when I, when I talk about this now particularly with younger crowds I, I often get a, this sounds like a millennial reaction, right? And the idea that, you know, the millennial, millennial-ish generation are an entitled group of people and, and they just want everything handed to mm -hmm. them kind of backdrop, if you like, it's this kind of idea that I don't actually agree with. So that's how that generation looks at it, right? And then I, I look at it as well, no, it's just, they're playing a different game. They're, they're trying to, what they're worried about and what they're building their reps for are just completely different. And we don't even see them. And then I, I go back to myself when I was, you know, that age, and I'm certainly not the millennial generation. And, and it was like, well, I was the same. I was impatient too. I wanted, I wanted things tomorrow. I wanted the fast car. I wanted the nice, you know, the nice house in London and so forth, right? And, and you, you say to yourself, wait, none of that actually does occur. There's always people. There's always people that want to work hard for what they want and will persevere through it. And there's always people who want an easy life and not to do too much. And if you want an easy life and you don't want to do too much, you're not going to meet my fabulous person test. And it's just no getting away from it. There's no getting away from that, that level of hard work that you have to do, both in the environment that you're in, in the jobs that you're in, in the works you're in, or quite frankly, on your own self-efficacy uh, from an inside out point of view or from a values and ethics point of view. And so that's, that's kind of my take on um, yeah, hustle. Yeah, this is vision. one of those that... Um requires a lot of mental toughness and mental strength because when the chips are down, everything in the human brain wants us to curl up on the sofa <clears throat> with tubs of ice cream in my case and, and not get out the door, you know, to, to check out. And it takes everything in our power to say, you know what, the small thing I'm going to do today to keep me moving and keep me hustling and keep me driving forward needs to be X. But every time we do that, I believe in the saying that it was a good friend of mine that told me from, um, from my grade school, my primary school, uh, his name is Hal Cousins, if he gets to hear this, this will make him smile, but his phrase was always, action creates its own magic. And that always stuck with me because it doesn't really matter what the action is, but the fact is you, from an energy perspective, life is all just energy, and it's always morphing from one, one type of energy to another. You're creating energy that's gonna create something and you don't know how it's gonna turn out, but that's okay. It's not being attached to the outcome. It's just creating the energy we need to keep things moving forward. And goodness will come from that. We just don't know in what shape uh, or form. And, and the beautiful thing here, which, it, which will be another podcast as well, is how to not control it, but really be not attached to whatever it is and just hold on to action creates its own magic. Yeah. Can we do the last one, Vicky? Yeah, the fourth and final one is being an effective communicator. Now, you're all probably thinking, oh, yeah, of course, that's obvious. But we go a bit deeper than that, as you would expect from us. So this is being able to communicate to the other person in the language they understand. And when I say language, I'm not talking necessarily only about uh, the physical language, but it's their emotional language, how they prefer to think. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you are an analytical thinker, uh, you are going to understand data in a very logical, analytical, fact-based way. If you are a relational, uh, emotional thinker, you can interpret what you hear through your lens of feelings. So all these different aspects allow you to see the world really differently. So to be a really skilled, effective communicator means to be able to inspire others through story and narrative and touch on what makes the other person care about what you are saying and understand it. And it means taking the time often to really understand what they care about. 
and, and look at it through their lens and the lens of others around you so that you are able to inspire them to action whatever it is you need them to do. Yeah, it's well said. Uh, and um, what I find, uh, I do want to bring up one thing on this one because I, I don't want to switch off anyone who's listening to this. Like sometimes people have been labeled poor communicators, right? Because they're introvert or they're quiet or they um, just don't, you know, they're, they're uncomfortable around other people or, or other genders, whatever it may be, right? And you, 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 you see, um, and that's not what this is saying. This isn't saying you need to be, you know, Tony Robbins on Absolutely. stage, right? This is, this is saying that you have to understand and believe that good communications are important. Because if you think about it, you, you, might, you might reach Yoda level enlightenment, yeah? And you might figure out world peace. If you don't have any way to communicate that to anyone, oh it's a gosh, terrific yeah. waste. <laughs> it's like, it's like well, you know, what is the point, right? Let's say, let's say you figure out nuclear fusion at the room temperature. That'd be a wonderful thing in terms of energy. On the other hand, um, if you can't, if, if no one's prepared to listen to you or you can't communicate in a way that anyone else can understand, then it's kind of irrelevant. So, so this, this kind of notion of, of being a great communicator in the way we talk about it is, is not necessarily being a prolific communicator. It's recognizing the value of good communications and ensuring that it's, it's, a, it's a big part of what you put around you. Because, because in the end of the day, people, other people can only receive what you communicate. Well put, Phipps, well put. And so, and so you have to be able to communicate through not just your words, but through your spirit, through your body language, through your tone, through your Zoom persona, through your Zoom backdrop. I don't know, whatever, whatever we're talking about, these things are all communicating, you know, through our LinkedIn profiles, our Instagram pictures, whatever it may be. They're all, they're all communicating something. And um, when those things line up and they're perfectly authentic, it's extremely powerful. So that, that's what I mean when I say great communication. Yeah, I love that, Vips. So Vips, um, I know we're at the top of the hour. So why don't, why don't you give us your key takeaways from this segment? And we will hold this group in suspense for the next segment when we'll be looking at the four Ds of a fabulous individual. Yeah, so I, I guess what we're hoping is today, what we've done, is we've given you, we've given you it's quite, quite rich, we didn't just gloss over some of these things. We've, we've tried to go a little bit deeper and, and give you some nuance around, you know, how we think of leadership, how we think of fabulous, uh, how, how we think of being fabulous. And our hope is that that's just um, tweaked your curiosity. Okay. And we've given you the fabulous person, non-negotiables, uh, you know, for fun, um, you know, grab a sheet of paper, write down, you know, write down the, write down the four of them, aligned values and ethics, you know, great communicators, Grit and hustle, inside out mentality. Score yourself one to five. Ask yourself, you know, when do I do this well? When do I not do this well? Um, do, I, do I really want to be fabulous? Do I really want to persistently rewire? Like, do, do, I, do I want to have some purposeful, positive impact on the world? Or do I just want to tell people that I want to have purposeful, positive impact in the world, but are quite happy, you know? curling up with Netflix and watching TV six, six, six hours a day. I, I don't, there's no judgment in that. I think it's, um, the more we can get comfortable with the people that we want to be, the more we will create space for the ones that want to lead. And we can also be a lot more comfortable with the person that we want to be if we don't. And that's totally fine. Um, so for those of you, uh, I've tried to give you guys, I guess, an audience opt-in, opt-out mechanism. Right, like, like, do you do you want um, do you aspire to what fabulousness represents? Do you want to make that that kind of impact? If you do, um, and those four non-negotiables resonate, they're the DNA for being fluid and adaptable and being able to rewire. So a teaser for next time is we're going to go into four Ds, and that's where we're going to go deeper. So four Ds are more characteristics that are leadership characteristics that are more important now because the world is more fluid, more, more ambiguous, hotter, flatter, and crowded to use Friedman, to use Friedman from earlier on. So because, because adaptability is so important for leaders going forward relative to experience and expertise, it's more how quickly can I learn something new and apply it rather than how brilliant am I at AWS, right? 
Um, because, because that need to learn is more, certain leadership characteristics become more important. At a high level, we're not gonna go into detail on them, but the four Ds are to be daring, to be very deliberate about what you do and what you don't do, to be very dynamic, which means being very comfortable with fluidity and seeking discovery. You have to be the kind of person that's willing to be curious, willing to take risks, willing to try new things. And really segment two, our second podcast is really gonna take us into the place of diving deep into the four Ds and in particular, what does it look like to be daring? And what is it appropriate? What is an appropriate level of daring at different stages of your career? Um, you know, certain things are just too daring. If you, try to, if you try to get too daring as an intern, you're probably gonna, it's probably not gonna work out too well for you. On the other hand, if you're an executive and you're not being daring enough, you're probably sending a message to your CEO that you don't have what it takes to operate at the big table. So, you know, these are, these, that's what we're gonna explore, this concept of daring. Uh, for different stages of your life and career in our next podcast. And I hope that was interesting for you. Vicky. And what I, um, what I love about this is as we think about those uh, four Ds and you think about them with the non-negotiables, the question you really have to ask yourself is, are you willing to have what it takes to constantly challenge your ego and how you show up every day to question whether it's really appropriate for what the world needs right now? And do you want to have a lasting impact and legacy on the world with something profound that the world needs? And if you do, these fabulous non-negotiables are going to be what sets you up. It's what, they, it's what I hire for when I help my clients build fabulous organizations. It's what we manage growth and performance to. Because once you have those, you've got the DNA for what's needed for whatever journey hits us. It's pandemic today. Who knows what it is? Just a few months ago, it was the Australian fires. I mean, who, who can remember those now? You know, it's, <laughs> that feels like a, a decade ago. Our life is changing so quickly and the challenges are exponential. But if we have that ability to look at it through those lens of the four non-negotiables, then we always see the upside. We always see the opportunity. Even when things are really tough, we're able to create that action which has its own magic. Yeah. And you know, you know, you just reminded me, Vicky, something that I think we at ThinkShift, all of us, we're not very good at talking about, I don't know, maybe it's our Englishness or at least too many years in England, maybe for you in your case from South Africa, but, but people who are fabulous tend to earn a stack load of money too. <laughs> so they, they, I mean, there's this kind of idea that, that they, you're not worried about the money so much because you're earning enough of it. And that kind of happens as a byproduct of the things we're talking about, as opposed to the reason why you're doing it. And I think sometimes we're, I don't know, our, our Britishness maybe stops us from talking, at least certainly my Britishness uh, stops me from talking about it. Um, and I, uh, you know, I've been called out in the past as, uh, you know, perhaps you should talk about it more because I started making a shit ton more money after I started thinking about things this way. And I said, yeah, yeah, well, what did you think? Of course it was. I mean, and I kind of, for me, it wasn't a big deal, but I, I sometimes forget that it's not obvious to everyone. And so, you know, holistic success, holistic success and fabulousness kind of presupposes reasonable amount of financial wealth as well. It comes to you, you know, it, it, it really does. And that shouldn't get lost in all of this. Oh, I love that you call that out because <clears throat> we get tired so closely to titles and money and the, the feeling of that limitation that we can only get that in the particular environment we're in and everything else is risky. But actually when you realize actually all you're doing is restricting your life purpose and what you're designed to do on the planet and actually that's damn selfish. When you let go of that and go out into the world as who you're supposed to be in the world and start operating from these principles, um, suddenly you start to realize that money is just energy. And the more money you want, the more creative you get. And the more energy you put out there, the more you get back. And it becomes very, very circular. And it allows you then to invest in the resources for the world you want to create. And you start purchasing and spending on the, the services that make the world the place you want to live in. And it then becomes a place of abundance, Vips. And I feel like that's a great place to end. That is a wonderful place to end. Thank you all. I think that's a wrap. Have a great week. And until next time, everyone, be fabulous. Mm -hmm.